Hello Retro Fans! Welcome to my first video of 2020 and therefore I wish you a very happy new year and uh, I think 2020 is going to be an awesome year as well and uh, I have a couple of topics in mind I want to cover and uh, I have to see how I get this uh, with the rhythm of the videos so I will have kind of a mix between uh, some technical videos, uh, something that where I really have to do some research, where I have to do a lot of testing, uh, like this video for example, and uh, there will be some uh, easy videos in between as well, where I'm more like, uh, like a stand-up thingy, where I have something to present, something to talk about, and then we will go and mix this in a certain way so that I can maintain an almost weekly rhythm, maybe interrupted by vacation or business trips, something like this. I don't know. But uh, let's uh, move on. We got a lot of things to cover, so therefore, no. And yeah, I'm back. So I have announced this for quite a while and I did a poll on YouTube and we're asking uh, what's going to be the topic you are interested in the most and people voted for FrameMeister versus OSSC versus RetroTink and as usual I got this on my desk already and um, probably I'm going to start with, let's say, a brief comparison of the devices so that you have an idea what I'm talking about. And um, as you can see, uh, I have placed them on my desk already and they are very different. So, I mean, the main purpose is to convert an input signal to an HDMI signal. And um, there are different, let's say, concepts, approaches, whatever. And uh, as you may see, this is kind of reflected in the way they are built. And um, the Frame Meister has been around for a very long time. And I think I got my first Frame Meister about, I tend to say, eight to years, maybe eight to nine maybe ten years ago so I'm using this device for a very long time now and I'm very happy with it and uh, there are just two or three points where I'm not very excited but uh, it's still something I can live with live with live with it well complicated but <laughs> basically um, since there are some alternatives on the market available and um, since the frame meister has two or three weak points i was interested in to see whether other devices are doing this uh, let's say analog to hdmi conversion a bit better and uh, i was interested in to see whether there is an alternative in terms of availability and price as well so and um, as you may have noticed um, they come in really different shapes so the frame meister is basically the device that looks like a an industrial product so it comes with a proper case it comes with a kind of a concept for the in and outs it has some uh, easily accessible buttons it even has some leds on the front which we can see right now and um, it has even the possibility to um, uh, work with HDMI input signals so you can either route them through so it's acting like an uh, let's say a, an, uh, a switcher so you can attach HDMI devices and then you switch between them and um, everything is um, easily operatable by a remote control 
which looks like this and um, it's a Japanese uh, remote control but there are overlays available so if you are looking for a more customized version then you can find this on the internet as well and um, therefore this makes a very let's say professional um, I'm going to say a very professional look and feel Let's put it like this. So, and then, um, as I said, I'm pretty happy with this, but I was looking for some alternatives. And uh, basically, about I think a year ago, a little bit uh, more than this, the RetroTink version 1.1 was uh, released. And uh, I'm just a bit confused because on the button it says 3.2 revision B. Well, it's a little bit um, confusing. And uh, basically this is version 3.2. So maybe I was talking about 3.1, but I thought it was 1.1, 1.2. Anyway, so, and uh, I had this uh, device for, uh, let's say, a couple of weeks and uh, I was testing this with uh, C64s, with uh, standard composite devices uh, like my Namco plug-and-play TV games device which has just a composite and an audio signal and then uh, I've tested this uh, with I think the C64 CDTV as well. This is a uh, this joystick like as uh, C64, and um, well, I wasn't really happy with it. So, and after some well time of consideration, I just uh, sold it, and uh, I was just using my Frame Master again. But uh, some weeks ago I just learned that there is a new version with some kind of new features as well. They fixed um, two or uh, three little bugs in it. And uh, I was interested in to see uh, if it is really an improvement. And uh, one, one criticism I had with the first version I've got was the build quality. So uh, most of the stuff was more or less aligned randomly on this board so the connectors were not really aligned in a proper way and um, the soldering was done in a very uh, let's say rush so it wasn't really nice to look at it and since it is built since it is built in this way that you can have a look at it i was simply expecting that um, the device is built in a let's say more professional way I mean, we have to keep in mind, although it looks quite tiny and small and simple, uh, you have to pay uh, at around 100, 110 euro for this thingy, uh, plus shipment, uh, wherever you are. And um, I have seen already that they are available from uh, Asia sources for about half of the price of 40, 50 dollars or something like this. And uh, I'm not sure whether they are the very same or if it's just uh, some kind of, uh, well, cheap ripper for something like this. But anyway, I got another one and I tested another one and um, to have a kind of summary, I'm still not impressed, I have to say. It is a nice attempt, but it is lagging some features, it is lagging some quality and it's... Uh, well, not the perfect device for all of it of it pur purposes. And as you can see, build-wise, it is um, what I call this uh, kind of spider concept. So you have uh, basically connectors almost all around the whole device, except for the left-hand side, where you have two buttons, which are a bit hard to access. So if you have this in, your sh in a shelf or on, on the desk, you really have to find some finger to put under this uh, kind of sheet here. So it would perhaps a bit better to have something that is uh, prolonged to the top part or something like this, or even having some uh, uh, buttons which are aligned in a 90 degree angle or something like this so that you can press from the outside. 
But uh, fortunately, if you have found one configuration that's working for you, then the device remembers this and the next time you switch it on, it automatically uh, recalls the last setting and therefore you do not have to operate it so often and uh, it has not that much options to operate it anyway. Um, one thing I really kind of dislike, and this is something I'm going to cover later on as well, you have to use an uh, so-called mini HDMI and um, this is a very fragile connector. It's the same connector you can find on the Neo Geo Mini and I broke this already. And the next thing is if you are in a, let's say, standard HDMI environment, you are going to need an adapter. And uh, I have some rigid adapters. So basically like this. And uh, you can just attach this to the back of this device and then you can attach your HDMI cable to it. And this creates a very nice lever to break this connector off the board. So my recommendation is basically to use a cable like this, where you have mini on one side and standard HDMI on the other side. And this is uh, a bit flexible. And if you put this on this uh, RetroTink 2X and your HDMI cable on the other side, then you have at least some flex. And if you move the cable around, you uh, really reduce the stress, the mechanical stress on this uh, tiny connector. And basically this leads to the next point. The RetroTink 2X requires some power as the Frame Master, as the OCC as well. But this device is powered with this uh, micro USB connector, which I kind of dislike as well. And here we have very, the very much, uh, very same problem. Uh, the connector itself is not really something you put some mechanical stress on it and it moves into the socket for just a few millimeters and if you move this around a lot or if you maybe have a stiffer cable or something like this then it is very likely that you uh, kind of rip off this uh, connector from the board since there is um, no mechanical support for the USB neither for the HDMI socket so this is really something you have to take into consideration Consideration, if you have a setup where you change your wiring a lot or something like this. You really have to be careful with this um, connectors. They are not very reliable. And um, it's really a bit sad that um, they come up with, well, kind of a simple solution like this. I mean... But anyway, so, and last but not least, the OSSC. Um, as you may recognize, the case construction is very similar. So it's kind of a sandwich and it consists basically of three different layers. And um, the main stuff is just uh, on the bottom of this device. And they added this uh, third or second layer, whatever you want to call this. Um, like a, a second story on a building for the purpose of covering the display and um, to have maybe space for this kind of huge on off switch and um, it's basically almost the same concept so you have this kind of spider wiring you've got connectors on three sides and i can tell you you are going to need all three sides for most of the time and um this makes this device a little bit, uh, let's say, space consuming. And uh, if you want to work with different, let's say, home computers or different consoles or something like this, then uh, you may have to change your wiring, your cabling quite often uh, because every console has its own um, requirements. And what I've learned, especially using the OSSC in conjunction with the RetroTink, for example, and while testing it on a lot of different consoles, you are going to need a lot of cables and adapters. <laughs> so this is uh, what I have used for my testing of these devices. 
And uh, it is very interesting uh, because most of the stuff is not required to run uh, the Frame Meister, for example. So basically for the Frame Meister, we just need a uh, composite cable for all the devices requiring a composite or coming with composite output, like um, the Nintendo Entertainment System, for example, or uh, C64, um, depending on your uh, connection you are going to use. And the next thing is basically the YC cable. And um, this is the second option, uh, which you can access from the front of the Frame Meister. So you have basically the composite and the YC signal. Some people refer to this as S video. And the audio on the front, and you have as especially this RGB connector for special RGB purposes, but I have no device that's capable of feeding this. And then uh, you may need some audio cable. Well, that's a standard uh, chinch cable then which basically looks like this and depending whether you have a mono or stereo signal you may need some kind of uh, mono to stereo converter which basically looks like this so i just have one input two outputs to create a pseudo stereo signal and uh, then you're all set if you are using, for example, a C64, then um, you may have seen a cable that looks basically like this. Just ignore this uh, green and grayish part for a while. And uh, this fits into the standard EV port of the C64. And on the other side, you have this YC connector, um, YC signal on the SVU connector, and the audio signal on those uh, chinch sockets. And then you are all set. So, so much about connecting the Frame Meister. If we talk about the retro tink, then it is quite similar. So we have this composite, we have this uh, YC signal, we have an audio in uh, just on the other side. And uh, basically we have a voltage input and uh, the HDMI output and then you're all set. That's all you have to do do with this one or you have for example an uh, so called YPBPR output a component output then you have to connect yourself to those three uh, connectors plus audio on the side and then you're set and everything is fine and except for this mini to standard HDMI converter it's not that much else required coming to the OSSC the world becomes a little bit more difficult because the OSSC has basically no, let's say, um, standard analog to HDMI conversion. It requires either YPBPR or VGA input. And YPBPR is available on uh, those uh, chinch sockets as well as on the SCART connector. And you have to feed in audio as well, since uh, only SCART is capable of um, receiving audio. Uh, and therefore you have additional sockets on this side, which is basically the output side. And here you can feed in um, an audio signal. And uh, then you have your video signal complete. If you do not have a... Um, SCART connector on your game console, something like this, or if you do not have the chance to use YPBBR or VGA, then you have to um, use some kind of uh, pre-signal converter. And uh, for this purpose, you may use the RetroTink. And then you need some kind of HDMI to component converter or HDMI to SCART converter and then the world becomes a little bit more complicated. So what I have used for my testing is uh, most of the time was this device. It's an, uh, let's put it in the other way. It's an HDMI to YPBBR converter. 
So you have your input on this side, and then you have your component output of the other side on the other side, plus your audio. And here is where the trouble starts already, because the OSSD has no change audio input. So we have to use this 3.5 millimeter jack uh, connector. And for this purpose, I bought myself an adapter like this. And I'm really keen on having short adapters because as you can see, the cable mass is just growing by itself. And then you have the chance to connect this uh, converter to your OSSC in a way that looks basically like this and audio on this. And uh, one remark, um, the OSSC is basically not capable of mixing a one-channel audio signal to a two-channel audio output signal. So if you have just a one audio feed-in, then you will have the audio just on one side. So basically you have to come back to a cable like this that makes one audio signal into two audio uh, connectors and uh, therefore it becomes a bit more messy on your desk or shelf or whatever. So, so much about um, signal conversion. Just one warning. There are cables available, they look like this. So you have HDMI on the one side and you have visually at least a uh, component output plus audio on the other side they these cables are available in a impressive uh, high quality as you can see it's with metal shields and all that stuff so it looks very rigid and very robust and uh, let me crank up the light a bit and uh, they do not work at all that's the funny thing because this is a so-called passive cable and the only thing this cable is doing is uh, taking some pins of the HDMI connector and route them to those change connectors. And the reason for this is that uh, back in the time of um, DVI connections, so that's the bigger part compared to HDMI, um, you had a chance to route audio to the DVI port as well as an analog, si uh, as an analog signal. And the component um, signal as well so but this is not available for HDMI so passive cables like this are not working at all and not worth even a simple cent or euro or something like this and um, I bought this quite a while ago when I was testing different capture devices and I was really surprised to see that um, they make basically no sense at all so, another way to connect your retro thing to the OSSC is by using an HDMI to VGA converter. So that's basically the input. This is going to be the output. And then you can connect your retro thing to the VGA port of uh, your OSSC, which provides a slightly better quality than uh, the component. But maybe this depends on the cable as well. And uh, what I dislike for this one is that it is very long. So I would really like to see a shorter cable. And um, you have to keep in mind, this is an active conversion. So there is some electronics here in this plug. And this needs to be powered by the HDMI side. So you really need a uh, power supply that uh, feeds in a certain amount of uh, power to the retro thing so a standard let's say old-fashioned cheap phone charger uh, power supply is probably not going to work i have used most of the time a uh, power supply which i use for my um, raspberry pis as well so that it is uh, let's say beefy enough to even power combinations like this and um, then you have quite an simple connection but you have to wire the audio to the OSSC as well and um, you have to keep in mind that VGA is not capable of uh, transferring audio so if you connect your audio to the retro thing it's not going to make any sense because you get kind of a 
stuck in a dead end. So you have to connect the audio directly to the OSSC, which may lead to some kind of sync issues between audio and, and, and the picture. So uh, I wasn't able to drill down so deeply that I had a chance to measure whether there is a frame or something like this offset between the video and the audio. But this is just something I want to uh, tell you just to keep it in mind that this may occur. So, and then uh, I think we have covered everything about uh, cables and adapters and converters and uh, whatever we want to call this stuff. So let's make some space here on my desk and get rid of this stuff for a while. And as you can see, there's still something left. So maybe let's remove this one here as well. And what I've got left now is basically a very short VGA cable. And I have used this cable to connect my Turbo Chameleon 64 version 2, which comes with a VGA output, uh, to the OSSC and to test whether I can have a nice picture converted from RGB VGA to uh, HDMI. I have used different converters for this purpose already. So uh, basically something like this. It's an uh, VGA to HDMI converter. And I got, um, I think, three different of them. And some having problems with certain resolutions, some having problems with uh, smooth scrolling and all that stuff. And uh, I'm using an adapter like this on my oscilloscope, for example. It has a VGA output and I convert this to HDMI. But this is not so demanding like uh, the Turbo Chameleon in, let's say, the Amiga Core mode, for example. So, um, therefore, it was very interesting, uh, interesting to test the OSSC. And um, I'm not done with the test yet. I can tell you it's working in uh, 64 times 48 very good without any problems. But uh, the picture for the C64 is a little bit too small, so the border is too thin. And you may lose some information on the top and the bottom of the border. One example is a Bomberland, for example, uh, where you miss some information. And I'm still trying to get the 800 times 600 resolution to work, which would be perfect for most of the, uh, let's say, Amiga cores or Amiga modes as well. But uh, here the OSSC is providing a strange stretched signal. So that's something I have to check whether I can do uh, some adjustments by um, those many features and functions the OSCC come in, comes with. Or maybe if this uh, needs to be addressed by firmware, if this is perhaps an issue of the um, Turbo Chameleon or something like this, as I said. I wasn't able to find a solution for this one, but uh, that's on my agenda because I found this a very nice combo. And um, the Turbo Chameleon comes with a uh, standard a 3.5 millimeter stereo jack audio output. And you just need a cable with uh, two of those 3.5 millimeter jacks on each side and then you're set. Everything is working fine. So, and the very last thing I got on my desk is basically a cable that looks like this. And this is indeed very, very special. And uh, I have used this cable, uh, basically I had to build this cable out of an old uh, Sony, I think, Sony Vario, whatever cable, because I have a C64 modded with a so-called uh, component mod. And uh, I have done a video about this already. I may link this in my description setting. Set section setting again. Wow, the first time I do this wrong in this year. Let's count this. And um, here you have a 3.5 connector as well, but with four um, signal lines, four connections, whatever. Also, basically, it's, a, it's ground and a tip and a two and three, whatever. And um, 
the thing is that uh, the ground connection here and the cable wasn't matching so I really had to rewire all of those uh, three plugs to get this connected to the OSSC and I have used this cable to perform most of the tests we are going to see in this video and uh, basically this is what I had to do for myself so this is probably not available on any shop or something like this and uh, yeah that's the whole mess I have used for these tests and uh, since I have mentioned almost everything I have used for this test uh, what I forgot to say the OSSC is available with a remote control as well and it comes already uh, printed with uh, certain functions and therefore most of the functions or basically all of the functions can be addressed by the remote control the OSSC has a display on the front but no uh, on-screen display and therefore you have to kind of uh, navigate through the menu here a little bit um, less comf comfortable than on the FrameMeister and uh, therefore I just want to mention this, but I've I've read that there is a I think beta firmware in preparation available or something like this for the OSSC that implements an on-screen display as well. So I'm really looking forward to this. This uh, would be a very nice option. And um, yeah, let's see when this will come. So so much about all that stuff on my desk let's move on and uh, i have turned this a little bit around so i was talking about those devices for quite a while now so that you have some at least rough idea of what they are capable of and what they are meant for and um, now i have prepared basically a small presentation where i started to compare those devices and uh, let's have a look at this presentation I hope it's going to work. Yeah, here we are. And I have to switch over to this one. And I have created a so-called quick decision tree by inputs. And I have those three components on the top. So it's YPBBR component, YC as video and composite on the, on the right hand side. And uh, the first question you have to answer is are we required to have a defined HDMI output? And I'm going to explain this in a minute, what I mean with this. And if this is required, then there is no way around the FrameMeister. And uh, to explain what I mean with a defined HDMI output, I have prepared this slide. We will return to the other slide in a minute. And uh, here you can see the FrameMeister has let's say predefined output resolutions and uh, with this output resolutions the frequency is kind of uh, linked as well so we have uh, 48 uh, 576 720 1080 and um, all those four outputs uh, probably not all of them are available in a progressive as well as an interlaced mode and you can have a 50 or 60 hertz output with those uh, predefined frequencies. And uh, these output resolutions are independent from the input signal. And this is a very important point. If you have a, let's say, a TV set or if you have a capture card or something like this, which is, let's say, a little bit picky about input signals and you connect the OSSC or the RetroTink to them and you have an old console that works in a strange resolution for example then the OSSC or the RetroTink are kind of routing this resolution through the device and you just have a scale option but you have no option to kind of force the output signal to a standard HDMI frequency or standard HDMI resolution and um, if you search around the internet for example uh, the uh, older El Elgato capture cards or e the older other media capture cards for example they struggle with um, let's say foreign HDMI resolutions 
And if you feed in, let's say, for example, a 567P signal into the OSC and you add a multiplier of 2, then you will end up with something that's out of the spec for HDMI devices. And so your capture card or your TV or your monitor may refuse the HDMI signal and you won't see anything at all. And um, if this is a requirement for you, then you really have to go for the Frame Meister because the Frame Meister is the only device of those three capable to provide a defined standardized HDMI output. So, as I said, the OSC and the RetroTing, uh, they output a signal which is always a result of the input signal. Uh, the OSC comes with four, uh, five scaling modes. It's one, two, three, four, five times uh, the input resolution. And um, if you add a device like, for example, the uh, the C64, for example, I'm sorry, I was just uh, a little bit stuck, and um, use a multiplier on this one, or if you have, for example, the Ultimate 64, uh, with, which which comes with a four a five uh, seventy six p output mode, um, then it is a uh, kind of likely that you create a uh, resolution that's not fitting to your HDMI device like your monitor, TV, whatever. And uh, the retro thing is very similar to the OSSC. It just has two multipliers or basically just one. So you have a one times or two times uh, resolution scale and uh, therefore you have even uh, less chances to uh, work with the output resolution. And uh, what we have to, let's say, mention here as well, the OSSC has a lot of tweaking options. So you really can try to match your input signal in certain ways by scaling, by defining when to start the sync of the line, for example. And you can uh, create very fancy HDMI output frequencies. So I on, on the NES, for example, I had uh, 1280 times uh, 1157 or something like this, so really strange HDMI resolutions. And uh, fortunately, my uh, Makewell capture cards are able to work with those uh, resolutions, but every now and then they refuse to uh, work with this uh, outputs as well. And you get just a blank picture or something like this. So this is really important. Uh, you have to keep this in mind. And this that basically defines the path we have to go. If we're going to ignore defined HDMI output, then we have some more options. And the next thing is if you are looking for scan lines, and uh, I know that there are really some people who are very passionate fans of scan lines, and uh, I, well, I like them as well. I'm, probably not a hardcore fan, but uh, most of my videos are recorded with scan lines. You may have recognized this already. And uh, you really want something like this and you really want a lot of options to fine tune the scan lines. Then uh, you basically have just those two options, OSSC or the Frame Meister. And uh, if you have standard analog input signals, RISE C and component, then you have to go for the Frame Meister because the OSSC has no inputs like this. But if you have a component input, then you have to go for the OSSC because the frame master is not capable of handling YPBBR input. And uh, the last question we have to answer here is, is it required that you have a lag-free device? And uh, with lag-free, I mean the so-called input lag. This is the time that, uh, let's say, is required to convert the picture to, well, to a deep digital signal transferred to your monitor and presented by your monitor. So that's basically the whole signal chain. And if you, let's say, a high professional game player, if you play uh, shoot em ups, for example, if you play jump and runs on the very last pixel, for example, and uh, if, if the timing needs to be just perfect then uh, there's basically no way around the RetroTing or the OSSC. Uh, they are not lag-free. They need at least uh, three, four, five, six scan lines. 
uh, to start with the video output, with the HDMI output. But compared to the Frame Meister, we are not talking about frames. So the Frame Meister, depending on the firmware, there are different uh, firmwares around. Uh, and it got better over the time. But I tend to say the Frame Meister needs at least one frame to uh, process the video signal. And therefore we will see some delay. And this is something I'd like to present to you right now before we move on to the next topic. And I have prepared basically a short video where I am trying to show you this as good as possible. Here we go. And what I have done is basically I have a capture card in my PC with four HDMI inputs. And therefore I'm capable of uh, processing four, as up, basically up to four uh, video signals, HDMI signals at the very same time. And what I have done here is I created an overlay of the video signals coming from this component modded uh, C64 board this one I have presented because here I have the chance to have access to the component signal to the composite signal as well as to the YC signal and uh, I have created a kind of a footage which I have uh, captured with a camera with an old GoPro camera with uh, 100 uh, FPS and then another one with 240 FPS and I have recorded this with OBS as well. And I slowed this down by a factor of 100. And um, you see that there are different um, tests, different settings. So this is basically the OBS recording. So this is not captured from the screen. And uh, you can see that the lizard on the bottom um, is basically ahead of the other lizards. And uh, what we can see on the bottom of this screen is basically the retro tink 2x. In the middle of the screen, we can see the OSSC using the YPBBR signal. And on the top of the screen, we can see the frame meister using the, I think the composite signal. Yes, I fed the YC signal into the retro tink just uh, for the sake of quality. And uh, on the top of the screen, we can see the frame meister using the composite signal. And um, I did this a couple of times. And as you can see, uh, they are not completely synced. And there's a simple reason behind this, because basically I'm using a 50 hertz system or 50 FPS system, but the C64 is not outputting a 50 FPS, 50 hertz signal. It's a little bit more than this. It's a 50.14 frames per second. And uh, this is a little bit a, a problem for capture devices as well as for the frame meister because the frame meister is working with 50 hertz. And therefore, it needs to kind of uh, squeeze the signal into this 50 hertz. And therefore, you have uh, kind of a micro stutter every now and then. And uh, therefore, you can see that the lizard is getting out of sync every now and then. And uh, here we can see in this uh, 240 frames per second recording that there is even some uh, delay caused by the display. So this uh, kind of afterglow effect. And uh, I kind of recommend that you simply just uh, rewind the video at this point and have a look at yourself uh, so that I do not have to make this so long. And I just want to show you uh, how I set up OBS to work with 50.14 FPS. I have covered this in my How I Work With series already, but uh, just as a small uh, wrap up, I have created this fractional FPS value, what you can see on the top left hand of the screen. And I uh, created those numbers uh, out of 50.14 FPS. And um, therefore, basically, I'm capable of capturing the right frame rate if it comes from uh, the analog to HDMI converter. But as I said, the Frame Meister is struggling a little bit with this. And uh, if you may have seen some demos with scrollers, some intro screen with scrollers, then you may have recognized that there is some kind of micro stutter every now and then. 
So, and just to show you how I have captured this and how my dashboard is looking like uh, while I'm doing so, I have uh, added this picture and uh, you can see I've placed this uh, little GoPro in front of my monitor and had this tripod on my desk and you, at the bottom of the well, picture you can see the board connected to those three devices. The frame meister is a little bit hidden by the tripod. It's uh, just below the audio device, in front of it is the retro thing, in front of the oscilloscope and a little bit on the left hand side is the OSSC and uh, this C64 board fed all those three or video signals in those three devices and then I was able to capture this uh, moving lizard and um, basically I have created a small uh, program basic program which uh, waits for the next frame and then it redraws the lizard position and it moves it by two characters and therefore with this kind of grid I can see how big the difference is and I have to admit I was expecting to see more delay for the frame meister so in average it is about one frame but uh, as uh, we have seen in the video um, they run a little bit out of sync every now and then but uh, basically it is less than I have expected and uh, for most of the videos I'm doing and uh, for most of the gaming I'm doing I have to admit that I'm using the frame meister using the capture card and uh, just using a capture program and I use this as a preview I have an option to switch this HDMI output to my display directly but um, I'm a bit too lazy to use this but well if it comes down to very fast reaction times which I do not have anyway but well then I have this option as well so then the next thing we have to talk about is basically the video quality and I have used this little demo called Akira Doremon is fucking tripping PRG because it has a lot of components I was using for this test or I was looking for this test and we have some um, we have almost all the colors in this picture we have some tiny details and uh, we have some uh, let's say areas with a mix of colors and this is the component output fed into the retro thing and uh, recorded by uh, OBS and as you can see we have some kind of saw to effect on the left uh, on the right hand side we have some colors kind of disappearing already so this uh, bicycle on top is hardly to see and uh, we will see it in a, in a minute that in the middle of this white dish whatever creature there is even a uh, small grayish line which is hardly to see and here we can see that even while using the YC signal there are still some unevenness in the colors and there is a uh, Let's call it mysterious option 6 for the retro tink. Uh, you can uh, cycle with the input button through additional options. And here we have some kind of okayish picture. So we can see that it is doing some kind of low pass filtering. Uh, this uh, kind of grayish line in the middle of this white uh, creature appeared. And the bicycle even looks much better on the top of the screen. So this is basically the frame, frame meister fed in with the composite signal. We have kind of similar sawtooth effect, uh, saw effect on the right hand side, not as much as on the retro thing. And we have some kind of shattering around uh, hard edges, so on the left hand side of this whitish creature. And a little bit on the wavy shapes on top of the screen. Uh, you can recognize this and um, the next thing is using uh, the YC, the, uh, the SVU input, uh, well, yeah, on the frame meister, and uh, the picture quality basically is outstanding. You can see that the grayish line is really grayish in the middle of this white creature. It has no colors. Uh, the sawtooth effect is uh, almost gone completely. There is a bit smudgy corner, a bit smudgy edge on the right hand side. And just for the sake of comparison, I added uh, the scan lines uh, of the frame meister to the picture here as well. 
So on FrameMaster, you have the chance to scale the frame lines, frame uh, scan lines, to scale the scan lines, yeah. And if you have a certain input to output ratio of your pixels, so talking about fixed HDMI uh, frequencies, then uh, you can really create scan lines that are very close to the original signal. And uh, I'm not sure why we have seen this video, but. Uh, this was something older stuff. Anyway, perhaps it was running in the background still. And um, I haven't done this with the OSSC because basically the OSSC is converting what you feed in. And uh, to do so, I had to use the RetroTink and the quality of the RetroTink we have seen already. And the OSSC wouldn't change that much. We have the chance to do some filtering with the OSSC and uh, there was a chance to make the picture slightly better. But um, I haven't digged so deeply into the features of the OSSC that I can say, well, it is making the video signal provided by the retro thing so much better that it is worth a comparison. Uh, basically, garbage in, garbage out, uh, I really have to find a way to feed a better signal to the OSSC. I'm not happy with the component output of this um, modification. And uh, basically I had in mind to use my uh, component modded NES, but it's still not working and I wanted to get done with this video. And I have promised to make this for quite a while and uh, Adding the NES repair on top of it would have delayed it by another two weeks or something like this. So, we still have a couple of slides left of my comparison presentation. So, let's move back to this one and have a look what we haven't covered yet. So, let's do a quick rip, wrap up of this page. Um, I think I think I talked about everything. I talked about the HDMI input as well. As I said, the FrameMeister has two HDMI inputs and you can just pass them through. So it's some kind of HDMI switcher. Or you can even apply most of the options the FrameMeister is offering to those HDMI pictures as well. So you can, uh, you are able to convert a smaller HDMI signal in terms of resolution to a standard 1080p. You can add scan lines, you can add filters, you can change colors and all that stuff. So it is very, very powerful. But since the other two devices aren't offering those features, I have excluded this. So let's move on to the other pages. Uh, we talked about this one already. Then uh, the next quick decision tree is by quality. And we have watched the video now, so we have basic understanding what I'm talking about. And if it comes down to the signal conversion of a YC or composite signals, then the frame masters, well, there is basically no challenge. It is the best device of those three. Uh, three and if you're really looking for an outstanding uh, video signal conversion, then this is the way to go. And uh, I have uh, some uh, modded uh, C64 boards. I'm just going to show you this uh, briefly. Uh, they basically look like this. I think you have seen them in some of my videos already. And uh, this is the so-called modulator mod developed by a guy called Auspuff2. It's his nick. At the Forum64. And uh, basically all of my C64s are modded with this type of modulator mod. And here you have the chance to use additional signals from the VIC-2 to compensate for this kind of a grid or bar effect the C64 is producing. And you even can reduce some shattering around uh, harsh edges, characters and something like this by adjusting those two uh, potential meters or adjustable resistors. And uh, this is basically creating uh, in combination with the frame meister an output that looks basically like an emulator. So if you're looking for something like this, but want to have the real deal on your desk, then uh, I highly recommend going this direction. So switching back to this uh, presentation. 
Next thing we have covered already as well, scan lines. If you are looking to add scan lines to your videos, then uh, basically you have just two options, OSSC or FrameMeister. I tend to say they are kind of equal. So basically the OSSC has a lot of options to fine tune the scan lines and the FrameMeister has a lot of options to fine tune the scan lines. Both devices with the most recent uh, firmware are capable of creating vertical scan lines as well. So if you are building a cabinet, for example, an arcade cabinet, and you have an upside down or a, a, a turned, 90 degree turned um, TV screen, and you want to have this real deal of um, vertical scan lines, then both devices are capable. And here it's just up to the input signal. If you have a component, then you can go for the OSSC. If you have YC or composite, then you have to go for the FrameMeister. This is due to the inputs available by those devices. And the next thing is options. And with options, I mean fine tuning, tweaking of your video signals. Then uh, basically OSSC and FrameMeister are kind of equal as well. I tend to say the FrameMeister is a bit better, but uh, perhaps I haven't uh, spent so much time working with the OSSC so far that I found uh, every single option and I, that I understood every single option the OCC is offering. It's is a little bit different compared to FrameMeister, but in terms of uh, picture adjustments, alignments, scaling, stretching, colors, all that stuff, I tend to say those devices are kind of equal. So, picture quality, this is basically just some kind of wrap up. Uh, as I said, the FrameMeister has the best analog conversion of those basically two devices. I mean, the well, the OCC can handle just um, YPBBR. And uh, if you have a component or composite signal, then you have to go for the retro thing. And basically, this is not alike. Um, FrameMeister has a lot of options for tweaking the picture and has a very stable output. So this is referring to sync issues. So if you have a capture card or if you have a, let's say, a TV set, which is a bit picky or something like this, then I have never seen any problems with the frame meister. The picture you get is there and it will be there all the time. The only thing the frame meister takes a few seconds until it starts really providing a picture. So it takes some time to sync it and this can be annoying if you switch on, switch off your devices uh, quite frequently. Then you have to wait a couple of, of, of seconds until you can see something. If you have watched some of my older videos, you may have recognized this already. And this is basically one reason why I want to use the RetroTink every now and then. OSSC uh, has a very good conversion of YPBBR and RGB, as I have mentioned already. Um, if you are using, for example, the Turbo Chameleon, or if you have an, a VGA capable device, then uh, this is probably the best way you can go. It has a lot of options for tweaking the picture quality, quite similar to FrameMeister. I've mentioned this already. And um, depending on your end device, on your capture card, or on your monitor, on your projector, whatever you're going to use, you may have sync issues, especially with this, let's say, alien-like uh, HDMI resolutions. So while playing uh, with the NES and some of the options of the OSSC, I had a couple of uh, dropouts. So the picture was gone, came back, and something like this. And as I have mentioned, I have never ever had any problems with the FrameMeister. And uh, well, last but not least, the RetroTing 2X has, in my opinion, a pretty poor analog signal conversion. Uh, we have to keep in mind, we are not talking about a 30, 40 euro dollar device. So if I go to uh, Amazon, for example, or to eBay and uh, buy some of those uh, Ligano, Ligavo devices, let me have a brief look, Ligavo, Ligavo devices, I can show you this briefly as well, no problem. They look like this. And uh, they come with different options. So this is basically a uh, component converter, YPBBR. I have the very same for a component and composite think, uh, thinking signal as well. 
And uh, as I said, they are pretty cheap. I use them, for example, for my Messiah machines because they are, I do not need smooth scrolling, something like this. I just need some kind of uh, acceptable signal conversion. And uh, this is what I call cheap. And the quality is kind of similar to the RetroTing. Perhaps the RetroTing is a bit better, uh, especially when we talk about scrolling and all that stuff, then there's basically no, no uh, challenge for the RetroTing. Those devices can't keep up with this. But if this is not your requirement, and if you're looking for a kind of uh, inexpensive device, then the RetroTing is perhaps not the best option because it's kind of expensive for the few options it has to offer. So, coming back to the presentation, uh, the RetroTing has basically no option for tweaking the picture quality, except for this mysterious option 6 I have mentioned, but this is basically just an on-off feature, so there are no values to tweak, you know, no things to adjust. And it comes with an almost useless smooth filter. I haven't even uh, used this option. I haven't even mentioned this in this video because uh, it makes just, it creates just some kind of smudgy picture. And uh, this is basically, I have no idea why we should use something like this. I mean, uh, we are looking for very good picture quality. We want to see pixels of our retro games. And um, even on big screens, uh, using this uh, smooth filter, it just looks awful, <laughs> in my opinion. And, uh, well, this is the very last quick decision tree by Price. I have mentioned this already. Um, if you are looking for a component converter, then the OSSC is basically the way to go. Uh, they cost between 100 let's say 120 to 140, 150 euros. Um, if you look on uh, eBay or similar platforms, or if you are brave enough to order them from Asia directly, you may uh, cut this down to uh, maybe less than 100 euro. And I have to say for this price, it is an outstanding device. It is really working very well. If you look for a kind of cheap video converter for YC or composite and we just have the chance of pick one of those three devices then the RetroTing 2X would be the way to go except if you do not really um, care so much about uh, smooth scrolling playing demos and all that stuff then you can go for a cheap Ligavo device or some, something similar for even less money than the RetroTing is costing and um, if you want to have the options of the OSSC and all the tweaks and all that fancy stuff, but you have a YC or composite signal, then you can combine the RetroTing and the OSSC, what I have mentioned at the very beginning of this video. And then you have to spend twice the money, basically, because you need two devices. Or if you just say, well, no, uh, that's not what I'm looking for. I just need some fantastic conversion of my component or composite video uh, I'm sorry for my my YC or composite video signal and I want to tweak a little bit I want to save this to an SD card and I want to have an on-screen menu and I may have an HDMI device which I want to switch to every now and then and um, I have the money for going for a frame master then that's basically the option number three uh, the frame master is out of production, so uh, there was some kind of leftover stock you could order from um, the company. But um, there are some kind of resellers, so they are still around on the internet as uh, first-hand devices. They range between 350, 380 euros, dollars plus shipping. And um, as I said, every now and then you can find them on eBay and similar platforms as well. Uh, basically for almost the same money, so you're probably not going to save so much. And um, this is just some small sum up, quality versus price. This is something I have mentioned at the very beginning. The FrameMizer has basically the best design. It really has a, a real case. It has um, a very good signal handling. 
It has a very comfortable OSD menu and a remote control plus plus buttons on the device itself. So if you got lost uh, or your remote control isn't working, then you have uh, full control with the buttons on the device itself, which is not possible with the OSC. You got some stat status LEDs. You can see what this thing is doing. And uh, you can, as I have mentioned already, save your profiles to an SD card. The OSC is kind of rigid case build quality but it is open so it will collect some dust on the inside it has input outputs on three sides which makes it a little bit cumbersome to uh, find a nice setup in your shelf perhaps it has a nice display but no osd yet uh, i think it's going to come and um, it has some barrel type power supply the same for the frame meister and uh, lots of adapters required if you have a certain input-output combination, if you want to include retroting, for example, and so on. This is what I have showed at the very beginning of the video as well. Uh, the retroting 2X has, um, has some variation in build quality, what I have mentioned. My first one looked not so good, the second one is okayish. Uh, it has the same case like the OSSD, it's kind of open. Inputs, outputs on three sides, same like the OSSC. Button placement is somewhat uncomfortable and it has this fragile USB micro power supply thingy you need to buy in addition as well. So it's not included. And that's all I have for basically my presentation stuff. And this is basically the end of this video kind of already it's a bit lengthy i know but it's a lot of stuff to cover and um, i think i have at least covered most of the things i'm using every now and then with different consoles with different um, home computers for example and um, none of the devices is capable of handling an rf signal so if you have an unmodded atari 2600 for example no chance <laughs> you really have to mod uh, the devices then in order to get them running and um, something i'd like to mention briefly is i have used this adapter which has been designed by sven peterson and uh, manufactured produced by marty in the czech republic because here i got access to all of the video signals i was requiring for this uh, test except for the component signal in this special case and um, this makes your whole wiring a lot easier because you are not required to buy custom fitted cables or something like this it's all change or standard as video and everything works fine including the audio including a mono stereo option so if you have just a, a mono c64 like a standard c64 then you can route the audio to two outputs and then those devices are providing a nice uh, standard audio signal out of the box without any adapters so enough for this one it's really long it's a lot of information and uh, i think it is really um, worth going through this video a couple of times at least certain sections to see what I have mentioned about those devices and if you have some kind of understanding what you are looking for then you may find yourself a bit better somewhere in the videos and um, in this video I mean and if you have any questions as usual feel free to use the comment section I'm looking forward and I may do some kind of part two to answer certain questions like fine-tuning options all that things I haven't covered yet menu structure blah blah and then i may do something like this and um, yeah then um, as usual thank you very much for watching please do not forget to subscribe to my channel it's really very important uh, to let this thingy grow and to keep it alive uh, feel free to support me on either patreon or by joining the channel membership here on youtube with some special option let's have a look at this and um, as i said Feel free to use the comment section and uh, thanks for watching. See you for the next video. Bye bye.